are listening to The Crime Cafe, where authors talk turkey about crime fiction, suspense, and thriller fiction. I'm your host, Debbie Mack. Before we start, I'd like to remind you that The Crime Cafe Season 1 Story Package is on sale for only 99 cents, and it's a real deal at that price. It's got stories from all the authors who are being interviewed this season on Crime Cafe. Just go to my website, debbiemack.com, and click on Crime Cafe, and you'll find all the interviews and the buy button for the story. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce the award-winning author, A.J. Sadransky. Hi, uh, Alan. Yes, hi. How are you? Absolutely. It's wonderful. You can call me Alan, you can call me AJ, whatever you prefer. <laughs> Alan is cool. It's a great name. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you on making such a splash with the awards on your first two novels. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I've started your first, um, Forget Forgiving Maximo Rothman, and I'm already hooked. So uh, it's it, it, it's quite a story. Um, tell us a little about the uh, story. Well, forgiving Maximo Rothman really was a, uh, it, it, it was, it came really from my heart. Uh, I, I, to give you sort of a, a short version of, of how it came about, uh, my wife and I and, and our son, we moved to Washington Heights in Upper Manhattan, for those who are not familiar with uh, New York City, in uh, 2004. Now, Washington Heights uh, has an interesting history. It uh, it was it was developed primarily. Um, in, before World War II and during World uh, War II, or just prior to World War II, it became the home of a large immigrant population from Nazi Germany, mostly Jewish refugees. Over the years, uh, that uh, community uh, matured and, then, and, and uh, the residents moved away and the neighborhood changed. And one of the big, um, uh, one of the big uh, components of the next immigrant community was the Dominican community, which started to arrive here uh, in the 1980s. Uh, so you have a very, very interesting kind of community here. You you have this large uh, uh, immigrant Dominican population, and then you have uh, the remnants of this uh, this old German Jewish population. And you also have a group who came in the 70s and the 80s, which um, are the uh, what used to be called refuseniks during um, the Soviet period. They were Jews who uh, wanted to leave the Soviet Union and were not permitted to. They were refused permission to immigrate. Uh, and so that, that that's you had these three communities here in Washington Heights, and this fascinated me. The reason it fascinated me was because. Uh, it, it's, it's very unusual. They live in the same space, and being in New York City, the space is very, very tight. You know, we're on top of each other, yet they have virtually no uh, interaction. These communities exist side by side, but they don't really interact with each other. So I was fascinated by Washington Heights. At the same time, I had a very strong and unusual connection to the Dominican Republic. My great uncle, my grandfather's brother, uh, he was a refugee there. So uh, to give you a short version of the story, my grandfather was one of nine children. He was born in uh, Austria-Hungary. They're Hungarians. And the area where they lived became Czechoslovakia in 1919. Uh, he came here in 1923, and in the early 30s, uh, seeing the rise of fascism in Europe, uh, he wanted to bring his family, and he started the process, but it was very, very difficult. And by the late 30s, it had become uh, a real uh, dangerous situation. He applied for um, visas to bring his family, but only his mother was approved, and then she would be able to bring the children. Uh, due to all kinds of circumstances, uh, that never happened. So my uncle... Uh, was desperate to get out, and he, um, in the middle of the night, he had an employee who came to him and told him, uh, Max, if you don't leave tonight, the, uh, the, the, you know, the secret police are coming to take you in the morning, and they're going to put you in a concentration camp. So he left uh, the city they lived in, which was called Chetnik, and they um, escaped over the Hungarian border. Uh, to make a long story short, they landed in Italy, and they were stuck in Italy in May of 1940 when the German and Italian forces uh, attacked France. So uh, the Italian government, under pressure from Hitler, uh, was asked to, ish to expel all non-Italian Jews, or they had to go into concentration camps. So my aunt went into hiding. My uncle went into a concentration camp in Italy, and uh, from there he was given the opportunity to go to the Dominican Republic to a place called Sosua through an organization called the Dominican Republic Settlement Association. So what was Sosua? 
1938, uh, during the, the, the summer of that, uh, 1938, uh, Roosevelt called a conference, which was held in Avion, France, where 28 nations attended this conference in order to discuss how they were going to, to uh, relieve the problem of the, the, the so-called Jewish immigration problem that existed in Germany. Uh, Germany at that point was uh, dead set on getting the Jews out of the country, and no place would take them. The only... Um, nation in the world that offered substantial uh, possibilities for immigration was the Dominican Republic. Uh, there, you know, the question is, why would Trujillo, a fascist himself, who was the then dictator of the Dominican Republic, offer to do this? Well, the truth is that, A, he was trying to curry favor with the United States because uh, two years earlier he had massacred 26,000 Haitians mm -hmm. along the Dominican and Haitian border uh, in what was known as the Parsley War. Uh, then uh, he also thought that by bringing uh, Jewish settlers, uh, he was going to take up to 100,000, uh, he would be able to uh, lighten the skin, so to speak, of the Dominican people. He was, in fact, a terrible racist. He himself was dark-skinned and would cover himself with pancake makeup to appear lighter. And he thought that by bringing mostly uh, Jewish men who were, for the most part, you know, white, they were all white, uh, he, they would intermarry with the local women and thereby lighten the complexion of the Dominican people. As a result of this, uh, he offered to, um, to take a large-scale immigration. Unfortunately, the Jewish leadership, and this is the tragedy of the story, the Jew international Jewish leadership, at that time, they did not want to uh, accept an offer for mass emigration to anywhere but Palestine because they felt that it would weaken their case if they could not, and they, they would not be able to force the British to open the doors in Palestine at that time, which the British never did. So the result was that 854 refugees went to Sosua, among them my aunt and uncle. So I wanted to tell that story. And as I researched the story, I came to understand that um, the plight of uh, 854 unhappy Jewish refugees in the tropics with their wool clothing was not going to carry a novel. At the same time, I was fascinated by the place that I was living in up here in Washington Heights. And what I did was I found a way to meld the two stories together. So I wrote a murder mystery that happens in the present in Washington Heights, and I tied it to uh, a historical backstory that happens in Sosua in the 1940s. Well, and that's that is, how the book was born. That is absolutely amazing. That story is amazing. I mean, the, all that background. Um, and I had no clue before this what what role, you know, how much of a role the Dominican Republic played in protecting Jews from the Holocaust. Uh, did you learn about this through your family? And yes. Uh, uh, yes, I knew about Sosua from my family because I well, this first of all, this uncle who was in the DR, he came here in 1950, and as a child, I was close to him, and so um, I knew about Sosua, and I knew about that he, the fact that he had been, uh, he had been settled there. Now it's interesting because you know uh, I'm come from immigrant families on both sides. All my grandparents uh, came here from, from Europe. So, uh, you know, uh, I first, the first language that was spoken in the house where I lived was we lived with my mother's parents was actually Hungarian, and I spoke a little Hungarian. But as a kid, I went to, to school, and in the New York City schools in those years, uh, in the fourth grade, you started studying Spanish. Uh -huh. uh, very unlike today, uh, where, you know, the ability to speak a second language is, 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 is not viewed you know, well anymore, unfortunately. But, um, I, I know. you know, uh, we have a terrible, and you know, it's interesting because my new book, Mariela Camacho, deals a lot with the whole question of immigration. And I, I think I'm very fortunate the book is coming out now when this is such a, a, a national topic. And I'm hoping that as people read my book, uh, they will perhaps, it, it may change some opinions about immigration and particularly about Latino people, uh, because I, I see that there's a terrible, terrible um, misunderstanding of their place in our society. Uh, anyway, uh, back to what I, what I was talking about. Um, so my uncle spoke Spanish. And I, so it was very cool to be able to speak Spanish with him because no one else in the family spoke Spanish. 
So he, uh, he was a great guy, and I knew about this. And the interesting thing is that when you speak to most Jewish people, have no idea that this ever happened. Yes. And most Dominican people have no idea that this ever happened. Although when I'm, there's a lot of Dominicans, obviously, in my neighborhood here, and I'm very, very uh, integrated into their community. And when I meet Dominican people whose families come from uh, the area of Puerto Plata, which is about 20 minutes from Sosua by car, uh, it was four hours' walk back in, uh, you know, in the 40s. When I meet these people, very often when I tell them um, that, you know, my uncle had lived in Sosua, they will say to me, oh, really, my, my family worked for the factory there. So just, you know, because it's, it's kind of interesting, I would like to mention this. So what did the settlers do? Well, the settlers developed over time the most successful privately held business in the Dominican Republic, which was a dairy co-op. They raised cattle on this farm, Sosua, and they jointly, what they would do is they, they, had, they built a processing plant where they, they you know, homogenized milk, they made butter, uh, sour cream, cheese, and interestingly enough, salami. Hmm. Now, my best friend is Dominican, and when I first told him that my uncle lived in Sosua, he said to me, you know, they make very good salami. Now, it's very interesting because Dominicans... They now make a lot of salami in the Dominican Republic. As a matter of fact, the co-op, the Sosua co-op, Producto Sosua, was, was bought out by a group called Sibao Meats uh, about 1998 or 1999. And Sibao Meats makes, uh, <clears throat> make Sosua-style salami, which is a, a traditional Middle European cooked kosher-type salami kosher style salami so uh yeah it's, it's interesting that they they have this very long-lasting effect on the people of the republic but few people outside of the area know the story hmm. well it's fascinating and uh do you do a lot of research before you write the plot or did you do research as you were writing it <clears throat> excuse me i do both in this case i had done research over the years uh, because, you know, after my uncle, my uncle passed away when I was a teenager and, you know, I wanted to know more about the place. And a few years ago, well, actually, it's more of a complicated story than that. One, one, one of the things that led to the research on this was that um, uh, my aunt, his wife, died a few years later. And when she died, their things, particularly their pictures, were distributed between uh, my parents and my aunt's nephew. Uh, after my dad died in 2002, I was down in Florida. Uh, I went down to help my mother because she needed to clean up his stuff and it was something she just couldn't do. So as I went through his, his den, I found a trove of photographs that had been given to us by, you know, after my aunt passed away. And these pictures, there were hundreds of pictures of Sosua. So I started to do a little research on this, and I really wanted to know the story because my uncle had a cer certain story that had been related to me, and I wanted to know how much of that was fact and how much of it was embellished. It turned out that a very, very good portion of the story, about 80% of the story was uh, correct, that I, the story that I had. And in addition to which... Um, there were parts of it that were even more interesting that I then found out later. Hmm. And in the end, what I did was uh, I did this research through the Joint Distribution Committee archives in New York. And in the end, I had, I had you know, 100 photographs of people I didn't know. So I donated them to uh, the JDC. A few years later, and I don't remember exactly how, I found out that the, uh, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Lower Manhattan was doing a show which I think was in around 2006 or 2007, they were doing a show about Sosua. And I called them, I got involved, and then I also told them that, you know, I'd given this trove of pictures, uh, photographs to, um, to the JDC archive. And they, those, a lot of those photographs were used in that show. So I had done a lot of research, and as a result of this, I also read several books, nonfiction books that were written as histories of the settlement. Once I sat down to write, most of that research was done. There was very little I had to refer back to. But to answer your question sort of 
indirectly or, or, or a little differently, I'm working on something else right now. I'm about halfway through a new manuscript. And in this particular case, because of time pressure, I'm actually doing research not only as I'm writing, but after the fact and leaving, leaving pieces open in the, in the manuscript. So the, I think for me, the answer is when I have the time, I like to do my research first, and then I like to sit down and write the story. When I don't have as much time, I will sit down and write out the story and then go back to get the pieces that I need. So for argument's sake, with this new work that I'm doing, it's a story about a family escaping from Europe in 1939, and uh, the action takes place in, first in Vienna and then in Brussels. A lot of the... Um, a lot of the historical places that I might have to refer to, parks, buildings, neighborhoods, I have left that blank. I will go back and fix that later. In terms of events, as I move through the story, I Google the dates I need to see what was going on in those places at that time so that I can, I can put that directly into the story. So, like I said, you know, my, my preference is to do my research first, but sometimes your schedule doesn't permit that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's understandable. And sometimes you just don't know what you need to know before you start getting into it. And I do. I tend to do the same thing. Um, you said uh, in the uh, acknowledgments that the book is about fathers and sons, and I can see what you mean now from starting to read it. Uh, what make you made you focus on that particular subject? Well, it's a few things. First of all, it's my own experience as a parent, as a father. Um, you know, uh, this, this, this is a question that I, asked, I get asked a lot when I speak. And um, when I speak, it's usually for two hours. <laughs> two hours today. So I have less than a, two hours. <laughs> yeah, I want to try to give you a, a more concise answer. So there were, there were really two things. First of all, it had to do with my own experience as a father and a son. And I think that what happens, I think that male relationships are very different than, than female relationships. I think, I think we're less open. And uh, we're less willing to tell each other, uh, um, you know, when we don't feel comfortable with the actions of, some, of another person. So with that said, you know, fathers and sons, it can, be, it can be a rewarding but at the same time damaging relationship. So I wanted to talk about that. And one of the things, the reasons I, you know, men uh, generally don't read novels. You know, the, big, the, the, the majority of, of people who read novels are women, which is why I always encourage my readers, please give this book to your husband. It will make him a better father, I hope. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to examine how, as a son, your experience with your father should teach you to be a better parent. And in those cases where your father's been a really effective father, you should ha take that experience as an example. So in this case, in, in Maxwell Rothman, both the detective, Kurchenko, and the son of the title character, uh, Sholem Rothman, uh, they have very difficult relationships with their fathers. They're also both fathers. So the question, well, one is, Kurchenko is about to become a father. The question for them is, how do you learn from your issues with, that you had with your father to be a, a better father to your child? Now, one of the really significant things about my next book, which Forgiving Mariella Camacho, is that we, in, in, in Maximo Krichenko, the protagonist, the detective, is about to become a father. He has found out that his girlfriend is pregnant, and they've decided to keep the child. And he's a wreck about being a father, and that's a very important, um, that's a very important storyline in my book. In the new book, which will be out on September 30th, we see him as a father. We see him not only as a father of one child, but a father of two children with a third one on the way. So clearly, he's resolved those issues. And uh, that I wanted to carry that into, um, into my next book. Because, by the way, I'm, I'm really uh, working on a series of up to five books here with the uh, detective duo. Wow. So, um, you know, I wanted to, to focus on this to, to help men to think about, the, you know, how we should be cognizant with our sons of the things that hurt us as sons relative to our fathers. The other thing, which was sort of, uh, it was a stamp that said, for me that said, do this, 
was an experience that I had uh, he, living here in Washington Heights. There is still, especially in the specific part of the neighborhood where I live, there is still a, a, a very present, uh, very orthodox community, uh, of or, a community of orthodox Jews. They, they came here in 1934, 1935 from two villages, two small towns in western Germany. And they came intact. And honestly, I don't know how it was done, because in those years it was very, very difficult to move more than a few people at a time. But they came as a group. And they settled here, and they built a synagogue and a, uh, you know, they have various, they have, they have two schools, one for boys and one for girls, and they have a senior center. And they, it's, a, it's an old, very established community. And they're very, 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 very religious. Now, I had been in business with Orthodox people numerous times. And... Um, one, as a matter of fact, one of the times I was in business, one of my partners was married to a young to a woman from this community here. She she'd grown up in this community, and my my understanding, both from my own life and from my exposure to these people, is that the thing that they value most in their children is um, intellectual prowess. Okay, this is just you know it's not a, it's just not a judgment. This is not a criticism. It's just a statement of fact. They value. Uh, a child's ability to be, uh, a, a, you know, a, a good student, mm -hmm. and uh, and and particularly in terms of studying Jewish law and Jewish practice. So um, they also believe, and this was told to me many many times, that everything that happens is ordained by God. So if you get a cold, there's no microbes. God wanted you to have a cold. So I'm, again, I'm not going to judge. It's not judgmental. It's not a mm -hmm. discussion of whether or not they're right. This is how they believe. So when we moved here, um, I started go working out at a gym. I work out every, uh, pretty much every day, and, and I work out in the mornings. I have a buddy I work out with, a Dominican, the Dominican guy I mentioned to you, my best buddy. And coming back from the gym virtually every day, I would see this father and son on the street from their community. And the guy, the guy was uh, probably in his 30s, and the child had Down syndrome. Now, I started to think about this relative to what I knew of this community. Like, how does someone who um, comes from a place where everything is ordained by God as either a blessing or a punishment, how does that person in this situation, how do they react to the birth of a child with Down syndrome? What I saw was a gentleness of love and a genuineness in this father, that completely blew me away. Hmm. He, he, it was just, and I still see them on the street. The kid is, you know, the kid is, uh, you know, late, he's, he's got to be about 18 by now. And when I see the two of them together on the street, you can see that to this man, there's no disappointment the way he looks at this child. You know, sometimes you meet parents who they look at their kids and you can see in their eyes how just disappointed they are, which is, a, in my opinion, a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. Your child. Okay, you know, and you, you, you should be more accepting of your child. You know, it's interesting because that, that, that it was one of the points I made with Kurchenko and his relationship to his father, Boris Kurchenko, in, in Maximo, is that, you know, his father was this, this internationally known uh, refusenik who, who stood up to the Soviet government, and, you know, he couldn't be satisfied with, with Kurchenko's choice of being a policeman. That it was just something he couldn't live with. You know... You have to be proud of your child, and you have to encourage your child, and you have to you have to just love your child, and that's really what it's about. And that's what I saw with this guy. And I got to tell you honestly, from the first time I saw this, it made me a better father. And it was one of the things that I wanted to get across at Maximo Rothman, and it does carry into Mariella Camacho. The new book does examine this at some, uh, to some uh, extent because it looks at Kurchenko as he as a father. Uh, the bigger relationship uh, that's examined in, in Forgiving Mariela Camacho is between men as friends. Uh, we really look at uh, Anatoly Kurchenko and Pete Gonzalez, his partner, his detective partner, as, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a close look at them. How do, uh, how do they relate to each other? How can they be honest with each other? How can they really support each other like brothers? And the reason I chose to do that was because, A, there's this whole issue about men and, you know, how they can't open up and it's very difficult for them to, to maintain, make and maintain friendships. In addition to which, I wanted to look at 
this, the relationship or the situation where that would be most necessary. Now, cops, policemen, when they have to depend on each other <clears throat> for their lives every day, you can't be in a position where you're more dependent on anybody and where you have to be more honest with anybody than you can in that relationship. So I, I chose that specifically to examine how men um, can learn better to relate to each other on, on, a, uh, on a peer basis than they do now. And again, you know, I know that the main readership for novels is women and publishers and agents and every one of us have told me, Alan, editors, you've got to pay attention. I do pay attention and I do write for everybody. But I have to tell you with all honesty that I hope men will pick up my books because when they do, they come back to me and tell me how they really enjoyed it and it wasn't, you know, like a typical novel and they were able to relate to it. And I think that it's important That's for us wonderful. to promote. That's uh, absolutely fiction. wonderful. Thank you. I, I think uh, from what I've read and what you're telling me, um, what you're doing is not only ambitious, but just so well written and um, informative at the same time and entertaining. And all of those things go into making a great novel. So I think you're doing great work. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And I'm going to have to wrap this up now. But um, I really appreciate your talking to me and being on the show. And um, I wish you the very best of luck with this novel as well as the next one that's coming up. And when is uh, the ne the uh, sequel coming out? Okay, so um, Forgiving Mariala Camacho uh, will be released on September 30th. It is available now for pre-order on Amazon for sure. I know that. Uh, and it will be available as well on BarnesandNoble.com, iTunes, and, and several other um, uh, channels. I, I know that if uh, you, any of your listeners uh, prefer to buy, first of all, you can buy hard copy from any of them, but if they prefer to go to a bookstore, uh, you can go to any bookstore and request it. It is available uh, through all of the channels, the normal channels that bookstores buy books from. So uh, I, I would also like to say that if you, any of your uh, listeners belong to book clubs, I am very much in favor of book clubs, and what I'm more than happy to do for book clubs is, uh, if they're local to the New York area, I'd like to meet with them, and if they're not local, they're anywhere in the United States, I'm more than happy to Skype with them if they want to read the book and then have a conversation with me, and they can, they can get in touch with me through my website, AJ Sidransky, S-I-D-R-A-N-S-K-Y.com. And there's info uh, about book clubs there, and uh, they can just write to me at ajsidransky at berwickcourt.com, which I believe you can probably find on the site as well, and uh, I'm happy to respond. I want to thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I've enjoyed doing this, and uh, I'm happy to talk anytime you, you, know, you want. It just it, For me, this is a labor of love. Well, that's wonderful, and that's as it should be. And again, thank you so much for being here. And... Uh, just one more reminder that uh, the Crime Cafe uh, Season 1 Story Package is available for sale on my website, debbiemack.com, under Crime Cafe. So, thank you very much for listening today, and thanks again, Alan. Mm -hmm.